I have a humongous problem with God of War Ragnarok's story, and I cannot believe this game is being called a masterpiece or a 10 out of 10 when the flaws of the story are so apparent. So right out the gateway, we get that scene with Odin and Thor coming inside the house and talking to Kratos and company. Now, this is great, except for the part where when Odin offers a peace deal to Kratos, he just automatically declines without going into any reason why, and without Odin attempting to bring up any reason why. Now, I get that Kratos obviously distrusts gods. If there's a single video game character in existence who would detrust a god, it would definitely be Kratos. However, this is a situation which calls for context. You have the two most powerful gods in the entire Norse mythology right here inside your house, right next to your son. I know that Kratos is strong, but regardless of how you think they would, he would fare against individually Odin and Thor, or both of them together, which personally I don't think he stands a chance against both of them at the same time, but even if you do, the bottom line is that Atreus clearly does not. So you would naturally want to do anything in your power to think about how do you get rid of both of these gods from your house and away from your son as soon as possible. So that's the context that Kratos should have been operating with. But let's go ahead and analyze the actual deal that Odin proposed. He says, look, we know that our uh, Thor's sons went after you, you killed him. We know Balder went after him, you killed him. But we still want to try and have peace. So what does Odin do to try and convince Kratos? He says that he'll try to sweeten the deal by dealing with his ex, which obviously means he plans to kill her so that Kratos won't have to deal with Freya attacking him anymore. Now, Kratos just straight up says no. In the cutscene, we don't know what his reason why is, but when we go into his codex log, we get to see that the reason why he declined it is because he didn't want anything to happen to Freya. Now, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is that the only reason why Odin even offered her up to begin with was because he's trying to sweeten the deal. Meaning if the deal was fine beforehand, which he didn't offer up Freya, then, Kra then Kratos would have no reason to decline the offer. If the only reason he is declining the offer is because he doesn't want anything to happen to Freya, then all he has to do to tell Odin is say, Hey, I like your peace offering, but I don't want anything to happen to Freya. And Odin, from his perspective, should not have any problem with that at all, because if he did have a problem with Freya, then he would have done something to her way before he even came over to Kratos' house. So if he knows that he can finally have peace simply by not going after Freya, then he would obviously do that. Now, even if you think that, oh, you know, Odin's just going to betray him. He's a, he's a master manipulator and he's clearly just doing this, you know, for whatever reason. The bottom line is that at the very least, it would get Thor and Odin out of Kratos' house. Even if for some reason the peace only lasted 24 hours, that would still be an objectively superior position than what actually happens. Because at least it would give them time to prepare, or at the very least run away, or do anything else. But as a result of not saying yes to this, or at the very least not trying to clarify the actual details of the peace, like getting rid of, you know, making sure Freya doesn't get hurt, what happens as a result? Thor sends Kratos' ass flying, and then he ends up killing him in the fight. So, congratulations, Kratos. If it wasn't for the plot, you would have already ruined your family. Because when o Thor sent you flying, Odin was next to Atreus the entire time. So for all you know, he did something to Atreus, killed him or kidnapped him or whatever. And then on top of that, you actually died. So objectively speaking, this was absolutely the worst case scenario, and the only reason why Kratos and Atreus are able to meet is because of the plot. That's it. No matter which angle you attempt to approach this from, Kratos obviously failed here. Now, I do have to criticize Odin uh, to a degree here as well, because it really was unnecessary to have Thor knock around Kratos if your goal was not intending to kill him to begin with. If the only reason you had Thor knock him around was so that you could have some alone time with Atreus, like, I really don't see how anything...
that he talked to Atreus in private could not have been done in Kratos' presence as well. Like, if you didn't start fighting them, there's nothing stopping Odin from just coming back and having more talks with Atreus when he wants to. He really did not need to go ahead and start this fight with Kratos to begin with just for the purposes of talking to Atreus because Atreus, you know, clearly is an eager boy who wants to know more about prophecies and all this type of stuff, which Odin already knows. So there's really no need to have all of this bet on one single encounter with Atreus when you could have just done this over a span of weeks or months to convince him to join you or at the very least come with you to figure out the mask. And it's not like Odin is trying to keep the mask a secret from everyone, considering when Atreus does eventually go to Asgard. He has no problem talking to Atreus about the mask, obviously, because he needs Atreus to help figure out the deciphering of the mask and to figure out where the remaining pieces of the mask are. So, obviously, that's going to eventually come back to Kratos to know about the mask in general. So, I really don't see how there's any single piece of dialogue that Odin could talk to Atreus about that he needs to hide from Kratos. So, eventually, Kratos and Atreus make their way to finding Tyr. We find Tyr is a broken old man, and he doesn't really want to have to deal with any of this anymore. Doesn't want to fight with Odin, doesn't want to start war and all that based on his philosophy. Now, on a conceptual level, this is fine. Uh, you know, somebody who just doesn't want to deal with any of this shit anymore, uh, that's fine. But he's still going to be a part of our council, he's still going to help us. That's fine on paper. And then later in the game, yeah, when when the world tree or when the Sindri's house, when we get attacked, we see him come out with the shield. And as we're seeing this, we're basically thinking, OK, you know, he's taking baby steps to coming back to the old God of War that he used to be. That's what we're hoping that he'll eventually do. But then it turns out that it's actually Odin in disguise. Now, on paper, this is great. It's it's perfectly fine for a villain of a game to actually be one of your allies the entire time, and then it turns out he was the bad guy the entire time or something like that, or was it just a disguise? This is great on paper. The problem is, is what the payoff of all of this was. The only thing that Odin accomplishes with the disguise of Tyr is to fuck up his disguise first off by saying that Atreus is Loki, by saying Loki. And then apparently Brock gets like a hundred points in insight for some reason because nobody else in the party like intuitively picks up on this except for Brock. And then he goes all up to, uh, over to the fake disguised tier and say, "Hey, how do you know about this passageway? How do you why, why did you mistake Loki or mistake Atreus for Loki and all that?" And you're really telling me that the All Father, the great manipulator the great mastermind behind all of these tragedies who doesn't really do things personally but instead goes ahead and manipulates things behind the scenes that this guy spurges out right then and there and just stabs Brock and fucking ruins anything that he could have done with his disguise of tear are you fucking kidding me this is completely unbelievable there is no way that you can tell me that this guy, first off, he shouldn't have even done the simple mistakes he did to begin with by calling Atreus Loki. Like, I, that in of itself is already dumb. But the fact that he then spurges out and stabs Brock and without a shadow of a doubt making him Odin at that point. And you're telling me he couldn't keep his cool for just an extra second? You're telling me he couldn't find a way to just say, hey... Uh, can you hand me the mask for a second while I just analyze this in the closet or something like that so that he could go ahead and just teleport back back to Asgard are you really fucking telling me that all of this planning all of this deception throughout the entire fucking game disguised as tear and he couldn't figure out a way to just get the mask back you cannot tell me that out of all of the times we were listening to Tyr, and all of the times he listened to our plans, throughout all the times we went back to Sindri's house just to keep talking to him over and over and over again, at no point in time during any of those events, 
He couldn't have done something that just completely screw over Kratos and Atreus. He couldn't figure out anything at all to, like, you know, stop the people who could fuck his entire realm up. This is completely unbelievable. There is no way that somebody who was hyped up to high heaven throughout the first game, God of War 2018, somehow fucks up to this degree by just spurging out and just killing Brock. And and to think, this is the reason why Ragnarok starts, right? Like, after you fucked up not getting the mask back, you basically sent the protagonist into 100% let's start Ragnarok mode. It is absolutely, completely unbelievable. I know I've been harping that for a while now, but you cannot tell me that all of this planning somehow led to this this is not the all father this is not the manipulator this is not a calculated individual when he does stupid shit like this that directly causes his downfall right here and now and on that note i just want to talk about prophecy and how it's being portrayed in this game the whole point of prophecies in fantasy worlds like this is that no matter how hard you try to defy a prophecy it will end up fulfilling itself anyway because of some fucked up chain of events but in this game like the prophecy of kratos dying never at all comes even remotely close to passing he is never once in any sense of danger yes he died to thor at the beginning but that clearly had nothing to do with the prophecy in any way shape or form there is never a time throughout this entire game where this prophecy that atreus is trying to prevent even comes remotely close to happening so why the hell was prophecy ever taken seriously in this universe to begin with if the way that kratos and atreus avoid prophecy is just casually doing whatever the hell they want to do then there is no way that this universe could have ever taken prophecy seriously to begin with like if a prophecy says there's going to be a fork in the road and then you turn left but then you purposely choose right and that that shatters the prophecy apparently because that's how casual it is to just avoid this shit it makes no sense why odin would ever be afraid of prophecy if anybody in existence could defy prophecy as casual as kratos and atreus does it makes no sense for the concept of prophecy and fate to ever even be a thing in this world if it turns out that nothing actually is set in stone or at the very least like, you, you need to do something extraordinary to avoid prophecy and fate. That's kind of what I was thinking the mask was going to be for. I thought, oh, so this is how, you know, Kratos and Atreus are somehow going to defy prophecy, defy fate, and all that stuff. But no, there's no MacGuffin that's ever needed. There's no killing a god of fate of prophecy that's ever needed. There's no going through ex some extraordinary ordeal that no human has ever gone through before. They just simply defy prophecy by just doing whatever the hell they want, and the game never once, like, reinforces the idea that they did something that, you know, stops anyone else from following prophecy. They, they just casually ignore it, and it makes absolutely zero sense. And another aspect of prophecy that really annoys me is how this game tries to have its cake and eat it too at the same time. On the one hand, you have people like Kratos saying, Prophecy and fate don't define you. Your own actions do. Which is a great sentiment to have. That's perfectly fine. That's exactly the same story beat you would expect in a game about prophecy for one of the characters to believe in. But then on the other hand, once Brock dies, then the entire protagonist gang has no problem saying, Okay, let's get this Ragnarok party started. Uh, let's see, what do we need to do? Oh, we need the horn of uh, whatever. Oh, well, you already killed Heimdall for us, so we got that down. All right, what do we need to do next? Oh, well, we need to go to Suter so we could go ahead and uh, fuse with Samara to go ahead and, you know, destroy uh, Asgard with Ragnarok. So, wait a minute now. I thought we didn't care about prophecy. I thought we weren't taking prophecy seriously. Apparently, what they really meant to say is that prophecy only matters when it says that we'll do something good, when it benefits us. So when the prophecy doesn't say it's going to destroy all the realms, it instead says it's only going to destroy Asgard, then apparently everyone has no problem jumping on that whole prophecy bandwagon. Like, this is completely contradicting of themes. It would be one thing if, they, if the way they went about destroying Asgard 
was like through their own plans, through their own, you know, utilitarian sense of, okay, what's a good thing to do so we can win this war type of thing? But that's not what happens. What happens is that they look at the blueprint of the prophecy saying this is how they'll win, and then they go ahead and do it beat for beat because that's what the prophecy says. So it, it, it tries to have its cake and eat it too, and it's thematically inconsistent, and it's absolutely jarring to see this type of shit. The, the, the protagonists don't have to worry about the bad prophecies where Kratos gets killed from some way. They only have to care about the prophecies that says they'll succeed and that they're good. Like, this is so bad on a thematic level that I cannot believe the developers did not see this. And now I want to talk about the whole Jotunheim section. Now, thankfully, at least when I go online, pretty much everywhere I see, the majority opinion is, is that that it was way too long, and that it was incredibly boring, which I agree with 100%. This whole thing should have been cut out. I don't give a shit about Anger Boda. I don't give a shit about the Giants. I would have cared about the Giants. I would have cared what happened to him if it actually fucking mattered in the end, if this game wasn't rushed to all get out. But apparently this whole scene, first off, this should have just been like a cut scene. Like, you just have, like, a board showing a prophecy, and then have somebody go out and, you know, if you must have Anger Boda, go ahead and have her appear. But this whole section is way too long, and it just absolutely just wasn't needed in any capacity whatsoever. And it still gets me to this day that Jotun, that the whole Jotunheim sequence of picking fucking fruit lasts longer than Ragnarok. This is how you know that the game itself did not take Ragnarok seriously when you pick fruit for a longer time than the actual final battle of Ragnarok. If that isn't just a glaring, obvious flaw, I don't know what the hell is. So after Jotunheim, we then have Atreus and the gang go back to Sindri's house, and then the gang starts ganging up on uh, Atreus because... You know, where was he and all this stuff about wanting to go to Asgard. And I can't believe that we were having a retreading of Atreus being emotionally unstable. Like, we already put up with enough of that shit in the first game. But this causes him to then turn into a bear after Kratos grabs his arm and tells him to wait or something like that. And I, I just could not fucking believe... That we were going to go through this again with Atreus' emotional outbursts that leads to something disastrous like being separated from the rest of your company and all that. So that right there was something I, I couldn't believe we were doing again. Now, even though I didn't like Atreus' outburst and running away from his family and friends, I do, however, absolutely love Atreus in Asgard. I love everything about when he meets Odin there. And the thing that I was hoping for with the game is that when you're walking with Odin, you see how of a nice old man this guy is. Like, I'm thinking they're finally going to introduce some gray morality and stop trying to paint him as 100% evil. Because he's going around, he's giving people his blessings, the soldiers that he, the Einherjar that he gives his blessings are all pumped up as a result. Uh, you see him trying to make sure his Valkyries don't, you know, kill their opponents and all that. Uh, talks to Queen Na and all that. And when he gets inside of his house, he even calls certain NPCs by name. Like, people that you don't get to talk to or anything. They're just random nobodies to you. And, you know, to the rest of the game, it, they are. But it, it makes him so personal. It makes him so humanized. And I, I really have nothing negative to say about Odin this entire time. Every time I was Atreus... Uh, I wanted to always go back to being Atreus in this game simply because we're in Asgard and we get to talk to Odin, we get to talk to Thor, that type of stuff. Uh, you know, I wanted to learn more about Asgard. I wanted to learn more about the people in Asgard. Um, so I really love what they did with Odin here. Oh, and before I forget, uh, when Sif is talking to Odin there, I noticed that she was talking about the refugees from New Midgard. Meaning that Odin actually took refugees from Midgard to actually, you know, save them and all. It's not like he he made Midgard frozen. That's because Balder was killed and all that. So, you know, I'm going to be coming back to this, but one point I want to just mention now 
is that the Odin that we are constantly talked about from Amir and company is completely 100% different from what we actually see of him in person and even from other people who are not, you know, telling them to put on a facade around him in Atreus or anything. People who are actually going up to him and talking about something positive, which he did by, you know, evacuating those refugees and everything. But basically, I just want to point out that from my perspective, nothing in this game has shown Odin to be a villain at all so far. Even including making Mimir ahead and imprisoning Freya, since both of them betrayed him at a much earlier point in time than the previous two games. Obviously, he kills Brock and all that later in the game, but technically speaking, the, the doors were helping the enemy, so if the enemy, Kratos and company, have already admitted that they do not want peace with Odin, uh, and they're helping the enemy, then... Well, obviously, he would be justified to kill them. Uh, so, you know, I just want to come at this for this perspective that so far in this game, and, you know, even including killing Brock, this still isn't something that's like, oh, this is a villain move. Like, no, when the protagonists clearly reject his any attempt at a peace offer, offering, and they still go after him anyway, yeah, I guess I'm not surprised when this shit happens. And I just want to right now go ahead and bring up some examples that the game is trying to paint as Odin is being 100% bad for, where I think if we analyze this just a little bit deeper, we would realize, one, it may not even make Odin look bad in the slightest, or two, if it does, it's more of a mixed gray concept than just 100% black here. First example is when... Mimir convinced the dwarves to work for Odin uh, by creating those rigs so that, I guess, Odin could have, you know, more weapons for his army or something like that. Now, as a result of building those rigs, it somehow poisoned the ground that they lived on or the water or something like that, which prevented them from growing their own food, which basically prevented them from doing any other type of job other than working for Odin. Now, it sucks that they, you know, didn't have any other jobs to do, but the bottom line is that Odin did not force them to build these rigs. The dwarves did that themselves. And if the dwarves couldn't even figure out that building these rigs could possibly have any other sort of impact on the environment, then I really can't blame Odin for that. That's just the dwarves just being absolute fucking idiots and then ruining their own chances to do any other type of work. Uh, I, I don't consider this to be, you know, an evil thing that Odin has done when he literally did not do anything. He simply offered up something, and the doors chose to accept it, and then suffer the consequences of their own stupidity. Uh, that, 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 to me, that's not inherently negative on Odin's part in any way, shape, or form. And then one of these is called the Durl... Durin Stone Statue. This is an entry, an artifact entry that states that how there's this dwarf who wanted to create a world mill where it would produce high quality soil so that they could go ahead and have lush land again. So when Odin learns about this, he decides to offer up an unmeasurable amount of gold to the dwarf for the dwarf to simply destroy the machine. So right off the bat, if this was something like, you know, Odin being 100% evil, we wouldn't even be offering up gold to begin with. He would just be going ahead and just straight up destroying it right off the bat. But he offers up gold first. Now, obviously, the dwarf then declines. So what does Odin and company do? They decide to go ahead and sell products and services, sell soil at a cheaper price compared to the dwarf who was selling that soil for a higher price. And so when the dwarven people have a choice between buying the soil from their fellow dwarf for the sake of independence versus buying the soil from Odin simply for the sake of it being a lower price, they go ahead and voluntarily choose buying the soil from Odin. But yet this is all supposed to be painted as Odin being a bad thing. All he's doing here is selling goods and services, and when the dwarven people have a, an opportunity to just stick with their fellow dwarf and buy it from them, 
they decide to betray him and go ahead and buy it from Odin. But yet this is painted as Odin being a bad guy, even though this is literally nothing wrong. This is just capitalism. This is just somebody buying and selling goods and services. There is nothing negative about that. Yet the game wants to paint this as something, oh, this is so inherently negative, even though obviously it's not. And then you have the side quest for Freya, where she's trying to destroy, you know, the bad memories of the wedding and all that. And there, she brings up a part of the conversation where uh, Odin wasn't always like this. Meaning that in the beginning of the marriage, it was actually okay and good. But one day, he asked Freya to teach him this immortality magic. Or some, I think it was immortality magic to him. Um, but then she declined. And then as a result, Odin got pissed off and the marriage went downhill from there. Now, this one is not as, you know, 100%. To me, this is not as nearly as clear cut as Odin not being bad as the previous two dwarven examples. But, you know, when you're married and you're, you're, you're uniting the realms and all that, and according to Freya's own logic, the, the marriage was fine in the beginning and that Odin wasn't a bad guy in the beginning. And then you directly decline him from teaching this magic to him for no apparent reason. She never gave a reason why she declined it. Then I'm not going to be surprised when he's pissed off at you at this point. Like, sure, your magic, your choice, I guess, but... Um, I'm not going to be surprised when he thinks that you're an enemy at this point. Uh, it would be one thing if the if the magic somehow, like, you know, came at the forced expense of her. Like, if it, if it took away her life energy or took away her subject's life energy or something like that in order for that to happen with Odin. But from what we see, there was no downside to him, to, to her teaching him this magic from her perspective at that time. Now, obviously, if you know if you know in advance that hey, we're going to be going to war against Odin in the future, then yeah, we're we're pretty glad he doesn't know any type of immortality magic or anything like that. But the, the bottom line is that even in this example, where it's it's obviously not paint Odin as a good guy here, but it's not something that's a hundred percent bad either. Obviously, when you go, when you refuse to teach him this magic, which is incredibly important, especially when he knows Ragnarok and he's trying to avoid his death, then, and then you just decline him, you refuse outright for no reason, and you, you don't even say what the reason is, even though you said the marriage was good at the beginning, and that Odin wasn't always like this, then I have to wonder why you just didn't teach him the magic at all to begin with. Obviously, he's going to be pissed. Anyways... Uh, fast forward a couple times, and we eventually have Atreus, Thrud, and Heimdall go to the area where Garm is, because Atreus' mask points in the direction of where Garm is, and then it turns out that the, the shard of the mask was not even in the same realm as that. Okay, so first off, I have to really question what the hell just happened here, because... How, was the mask just fucking with Atreus for some reason? Like, how in the world is the mask, which we have already shown to be pointing in the right direction, and then it show, and then once like, it once it points in the direction of Garm, and then we're th and then Atreus is thinking, oh, maybe Garm is like standing up, is like sitting on top of it or something. So after you fight Garm and you know make it, or at the very least make him run away and stuff. And then Atreus goes over to where Garm was sitting. Then the mask doesn't light up at all there. So what the hell just happened here? Why in the world did you have the mask light up in the direction of where Garm is just to go over there? And then the mask was apparently just fucking with Atreus the entire time because it wasn't like not even in the right direction. It wasn't even in the right realm. Like, I, I feel like the developers specifically put this in the game just to have some post-game content with closing Garm's realm that were created. Like, this whole situation was absolutely mind-bogglingly retarded because the mask, all of a sudden, just randomly doesn't work in the area that it's pointing to 
and it was fucking around with Atreus the entire time. Like, I, I'm absolutely certain that they included this simply to go ahead and have post-game content. But then, even, like, later, when you, Kratos... When, Atre when Atreus and Kratos actually fight Garm, and then you go ahead and take Garm's soul out and replace it with Fenrir's or something like that. Like, on a conceptual level, you know, th this is cool, this is fine, because, hey, you, you, got, you got your dead wolf back, and now he's a giant wolf, and you're thinking, oh, man, imagine the shit that's going to happen here. But <laughs> when Ragnarok comes, he doesn't do anything. Like, it's a complete, like, who gives a shit that Fenrir is back when he does absolutely nothing of importance in the rest of the game. It's like, okay, we, we wanted to show you, get your wolf back, but then it doesn't even fucking matter anyway, at all. So why did you even bother bringing him back? Like, God, I was, I was so looking forward to, like, you know, doing something with Fenrir that would completely bypass some of Asgard's security or some shit. You know, some reason that we really, really could use uh, Fenrir as an ally to do something, but it just, nothing ever comes of it. And to talk about Heimdall for a second, uh, I really liked him as a character. Uh, obviously, he's, you know, a gigantic douchebag from beginning to end. Um, but I really loved how his villain role, and I loved how he was actually a threat, simply because of his overpowered ability. But I'm not really understanding why the Dropnir Spear actually did anything at all to him. The way the Dropnir Spear was described was that it was going to overload his senses. So I was thinking that, oh, you know, something about it would have like a passive aura that would prevent him from using his, you know, look into the future ability. Um, he's able to dodge the spears when you strike at him from melee range. And he can dodge them at ranged as well, but sometimes he'll, you know, catch the spear in his hand, and then you can explode it. And then once the explosion happens, I guess that creates a magical effect on his mind, which prevents him from looking in the future. But I still have the question, why could he not see the explosion looking into the future? Um, I don't really know how that was ever explained. Um... That's why I was wondering if he could just not see the spear in general, but clearly he can see the spear in the future. It's just, I guess he can't see the explosion? I mean, it, it, it's whatever. It doesn't matter. It was, it was a fun fight anyway. But I do have something to criticize of this, because it really makes Odin look like such a dumbass that he would, first off, send out Heimdall to go ahead. If he's trying to avoid Ragnarok, why the hell would you send out Heimdall to go ahead and fight, like, the key enemy you're going against right now? And, like, even if you were still going to send out Heimdall, why would you allow him to keep the horn with him? Like, that's the thing that absolutely just shatters my disbelief in this plot, in this story. You're telling me Odin, the Allfather, couldn't even take the most basic of precautions and not having Heimdall have the fucking horn when he's not in Asgard. Why would you allow him to have the horn? What benefit does him having the horn outside of Asgard do except open a possibility for Ragnarok to start? Like, that is absolutely... Like, I, I can't believe I only just thought of this, but it's absolutely mind-boggling retarded now that I think about it. There is zero reason why Heimdall needed to have that horn with him as he fought Kratos. And I can't believe Odin or anybody else thought to just have him leave the fucking horn in Asgard. Oh, and also, before you fight Heimdall, uh, you're, you're trying to get, like, this little purple square object that helps, like, the, the, the wolves chase the moon or something like that. And then that Einherjar dragon rider person steals it. Uh, so you chase her down, but apparently she's, like, leaving it on some random fucking rock just to fight you like wait a minute here why in the world if you have a fucking wyvern with you why did you not just simply fly away with the wyvern the fucking dragon with wings but why in the world did you not just fly away why were you waiting to fight kratos there like i know you're just a random npc mob but if you actually successfully stole an item which would make it almost, I'm pretty sure it makes it impossible 
for Kratos and Atreus to continue forward with Ragnarok, you know, even before attempting to get the horn and all that. Why in the world did you not just fly away on the dragon? She literally had, well, first off, she could teleport, so why in the world could you not just continue teleporting, but even if she could only teleport like a certain amount of times or a certain amount of distance, why the hell did she not just get back on the dragon? Like, there was no excuse for that to happen. That, that makes absolutely no sense, and it's really telling me that the plot is fucking retarded as it goes along. But what really gets me is how utterly contrived the, like, the next parts are from here to the very end of the game. First, when you get back, but before you go with Thor to the ice area to get the final piece of the mask, Sindri just coincidentally happens to make an item which will allow you to instantly warp back to the loading screen area, you know, the circular path of the world tree, whenever you go from one warp door to another warp door. He just coincidentally happens to make it for that exact moment in time. And then when you go with Thor and get the final piece of the mask, Odin comes and he's about to grab the mask. He's literally like inches away from putting his hand on the mask and taking it from Atreus. And then Sif, Thor's wife, and two Valkyries just happen to come through. How in the world did Odin not just simply complete his hand motion and grab the mask? I don't understand. And then even then, the whole thing with Sif, you know, telling Thor that Odin doesn't care about him or anything... Even though, technically speaking, like there's nothing wrong with Odin sending warriors, the Aesir, after Kratos, considering how Kratos has already admitted he has no problem going to war with Odin. Now, granted, it's still stupid as hell for Odin to send Heimdall, and even if he is going to send Heimdall, why the hell is he sending him with the horn? So yes, that's objectively fucking retarded from Odin, but there's nothing, con but there's nothing wrong with a leader of a of a realm sending people out to go out and defeat their enemies like that's literally what they're meant to do so the sif's entire angle like i get they're trying to protect their their kin their sons and daughters and all that but that, that's literally what they're signing up to do like they're not there for the sake of decoration they are there to be used in combat if the need arises if they were not needed they probably could have done anything else but, and then we have Thor, you know, just randomly go batshit insane over Atreus, who obviously did not do any of this shit. Uh, yes, obviously he's, he's angry that, you know, Odin is mistreating him, but to have him just go and attack Atreus all of a sudden is so incredibly forced. This entire cutscene is so incredibly forced. The timing of everything just happens to be coincidental, giving Atreus that MacGuffin item to warp out, not throughout the entire game or the previous game, but only because of this one area. What a coincidence. And the fact that Odin just won't complete his hand motion just to grab the mask. It, wow, what a coincidence. The timing of Sif to appear before Odin takes the map. Wow, what a coincidence. And Thor to just go after Atreus to make him, you know, warp away with the mask wow how fucking convenient clearly this whole entire scene was just so that they would have a way to have atreus keep the mask while getting away from odin and company it is incredibly contrived it is not realistic this is not what this is what happens when you're trying to wrap up your story this is what happens when the pacing is just go 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 rush mode it is absolutely incoherent at times. And of course, this then leads us to the whole Odin was tear all along scene. Uh, like, like, to me, it makes absolutely no sense that Brock, out of all the people there, is the one to just gain all of this insight and think that, you know, Tyr is just, you know, randomly, you know, bullshitting and not making parts meld. Like, yeah, it, it's a good question by Brock to say, hey... Why did you? Why do you know about this path to Asgard all of a sudden when you never said it before? Like that itself is a good question, and that's fine. Uh, but of course, Tyr can just say, "Well, Kratos would have led us all into death, or something like that." And that that's fine for him to say as well. Uh, but I just can't believe Odin would just randomly start calling Atreus Loki there after all the things that he supposedly put in place. It is absolutely unrealistic. 
for him to fuck up in such a manner. And it's so coincidental that Brock just knocks the knocks the mask out of his hand. But it, it, it's still stupid as shit for Odin to actually get triggered here and reveal his disguise and ha- somehow just ruin this entire, all the planning he's done with his disguise of Tyr. It is absolutely dog shit to believe all of this time planning can get fucked up by a single dwarf. It is unbelievable to think that Ragnarok is truly, the, the first gears of Ragnarok truly get set into motion after Brock dies. I like Brock. I like Sindri. In fact, I love Sindri's character throughout the entire game. I love his, you know, his transformation into absolutely hating Kratos and company. Hating Atreus, hating Kratos, hating all of them. I have, I love that shit. But to have Ragnarok started over because of a fucking dwarf. So it's not because all the other people were getting oppressed and all that shit by Odin, but because of the one fucking dwarf is what sets this all off. I'm sorry, but no. It's, it's, no. It's just absolutely fucking no. And then after this, we, we get one of the dumbest things. I, I just can't even conceive how this is even remotely possible to be done. Where Atreus and Kratos go to Musselheim and then in like five minutes find Suter right then and there. First off, why in the world is the door so randomly close to the one guy in muscle farm you needed to be to? But on top of that, Odin literally has a raven there. So he knows where Suter was the entire fucking game. And probably even long before this game, long before God of War 2018, maybe for who knows how many years. And you're trying to convince me that he doesn't just kill Suter or imprison him, or do any of the million different things he could have done that would prevent somebody from engaging in Ragnarok? How in the world can this guy, how in the world can the Allfather not even do the most basic, minimal precautions to preventing his death because of the prophecies that he's terrified over, and he doesn't do anything at all to get rid of Suter? He doesn't do anything at all to just hide him. Like, yes, I know there's Einhajar that are standing in the way, and I know that there are the two Valkyries he sends, but that's after the fact. They should have never even had a chance to go after Suter to begin with. This is the type of shit that happens in your story that makes the plot absolutely insane. It is not believable. Your char- your villains have to do incredibly stupid shit in order for the plot to go forward. And this is just another case among many of that happening here. Oh, and I just want to focus on Atreus here for a second when he talks to Suter. Because Atreus has his worst character moment in the entire series right here and right now. Like, this guy... We're supposed to think that we're we're trying to protect innocence we're trying to protect people out there and yet the first fucking thing that atreus does when going up to suitor is try to guilt trip him to commit suicide hey your your life is already worthless you're 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 not living for anything worth a damn you might as well just kill yourself for the sake of our ragnarok that we're trying to go for how utterly fucked up is this Like, this is some actual psychological fucked up warfare right here. Like, I don't even know if Odin's ever said anything as bad as what Atreus just did here. Imagine going up to somebody, guilt tripping them, telling them that their life is absolutely fucking meaningless, and that they should kill themselves because it will benefit you in some way. Are you kidding me? Are you fucking kidding me? Way way to go, Atreus. You're totally the good guy in this scenario, by the way. Oh, you, you know, later on, we're, we're supposed to protect innocence and shit. Oh, well, no, clearly not. Uh, if they're meant for your prophecy, you will gladly sacrifice them no matter what. Like, anything that benefits the protagonist, you will gladly sacrifice them for your own cause. So, yeah, I, I really needed to just point that out because this is easily the most fucked up scene in the entire goddamn Norse saga right here, as far as I'm concerned. So anyways, we go to Midgard, and where Kratos gives this speech, 
which like on a conceptual level kratos leading an army like th that's great on paper but then you find out your army is well the only people he's giving this speech to is like six seven people something like that so right off the bat you know you, you would think the people who you would want this to be listening to would be the army itself but uh apparently we just assembled an army in the easiest fucking way possible uh Freya is able to just make the light elves and dark elves just halt their shit and just immediately come with us to war and Mimir is able to convince Helheim uh we send Sindri over to get the dwarves even though they don't come uh, and we just send a whole bunch of people out to get all the various groups of people to come with us and it's it's like the easiest fucking thing in the universe for these people uh, this when, when you can see the pacing is so obviously too fast here when we're able to just assemble an army out of basically nowhere to start Ragnarok this is where the story obviously takes a nosedive like you cannot call a game a masterpiece you cannot give a 10 out of 10 to something that has such glaring problems with the story like this. Um, but anyways, so we, we go ahead and start the war with Ragnarok, or start the war with Asgard. <laughs> and another thing that just, that just is just absolutely mind-boggling to me is we kick, we, we kick Asgard's ass to such a degree that we didn't even need Suter at all. In fact, he actually becomes a hindrance to us because due to us kicking ass so much, we don't want him to go ahead and destroy Asgard that fast, so we even use some of our own forces to, call, to go ahead and hold uh, Suter back in his Ragnarok form. Like, th this is how you know that Ragnarok is a joke. When this war is so easily won without having a you know get the biggest player in the game involved at all in fact when you use your own forces to hold him back and after Sindri you know blows up those laser cannon things that are shooting at Suter uh, we, we then have a moment between Kratos and Atreus you know where Atreus is like close your heart to it and all that and then they have a bonding moment where they need to go ahead and you know save people this isn't for vengeance this is for justice or something like that now, the, the speech is cool. Uh, it's fine in, on paper. Uh, I'm glad to see that this is showing that Kratos is evolving and that they should you know, do more simply for the sake of vengeance, uh, but they're doing it for justice. But they're in the middle of a war, having a speech. Like, this is how you know Ragnarok is not serious in any capacity whatsoever. When you're in a war and you're just having this father-to-son moment in the middle of a battlefield where you don't have to worry about stray arrows or anything you don't have to worry about anybody coming up to you and you, you just stand there and just have a character to character moment even though the context of where you're having this right now is completely wrong to begin with this is how you know Ragnarok is not being treated with the seriousness that it should have been treated with and then we get a scene where Throod comes out puts her sword or machete, whatever, against Atreus. And then all of a sudden, behind a pillar, out of all of the places she could be, Sif comes out from beside the pillar, and who does she have with her? That one Midgardian boy, uh, that one Asgardian boy who Atreus talked to before he climbed the Asgard wall. Are you fucking kidding me? This is so completely contrived. This is so absolutely insane that, oh, out of all the people there, Sif just happened to be there, and of all the people that she happened to be there with, it happened to be with that one Midgar with that one Asgardian boy that Atreus talked about. Skolder, I think his name was. This is so contrived. This is how you know the plot is not serious. This is how you know the story is not serious. This is how you know everything is being rushed. This is how you know that conflicts are getting resolved in completely nonsensical ways. But this is just, once again, another drop in the bucket to the endless stupid bullshit that this game does.
And also, I really can't stand the fact that her entire realm that she is living in with her fellow gods and her fellow countrymen is literally being destroyed right before her eyes and she doesn't have a problem with Ragnarok destroying their entire fucking world. It, it, it's absolutely like traitorous behavior of the highest magnitude. It's one thing to, you know, not want your family serving Odin. It's another thing to side with the people who are actively destroying your entire fucking world that you're living in. Jesus Christ. And then we get the final battle with Thor. And I wish it had more spectacle like the Balder fight did at the end of God of War 2018. Um, but yeah, the fight was you know somewhat cool. The music was cool. Uh, I kind of wish that Thor would have brought more on, upon the fact that, you know, you literally summon Ragnarok to kill our entire world as opposed to focusing on f fruit or whatever. Because he would have been perfectly, like, justified in of itself just by that reason to attack Kratos. I mean, you have an army invading your land. You don't really need any justification other than that to say why you're defending your own, you know, realm and all that. Uh, but anyway, he gets beat. And then Odin comes out and kills him. Which, I, I admit, I was really hoping that Kratos and Thor were about to team up. Like, that's the direction I was hoping, and I thought it would be the most kick-ass scene in the game if it was going to actually be like that. But, fortunately, Odin just kills him like that. Which, I mean, hey, if the enemy convinced your greatest, you know, ally in Thor to go against you, then, well, you gotta deal with him, I guess. Uh, so then we get the fight between... Kratos and company in Odin, which was nice as a spectacle. But then we get to the part where the mask comes up again, which I don't even know why the fuck we brought the mask here. Like, like the whole... I don't know why we would even risk bringing the mask to Odin at this point in the game. Uh, that just seems like something that could have potentially gone horribly wrong if he got it, maybe. But I, I just hate how the mask turned out to be fucking nothing. We, we never get to learn about the mask... We never get to learn about what the secrets were. I don't see what the negative would have been if if Atreus just looked through the thing. And I also don't recall Odin saying that only Loki can look through the mask. Uh, maybe that was something that was said earlier in the game, but I felt like that was kind of thrown in there at last second. I know that Loki was needed to decipher the mask and help find the remaining pieces, but I don't remember early in their game it being said anything that only Loki can look through the portal or anything. So, assuming if it was not said earlier in this game, that I feel like that was kind of thrown in there at the last second. But the bottom line is that the mask shouldn't have even been there, like, if the protagonists were actually being smart. But, man, that mask was just an absolute terrible build-up. Even though it could have been used to justify so many things in this game. And then when, you know, Odin's already lost, I am surprised that he couldn't, you know, figure out that Atreus is literally giving him an opportunity to stop being bad or whatever. And, like, even if he's bullshitting, like, just, just go ahead and agree with Atreus and be like, fine, I'll try to be better or some shit, just so that you can, you know, not get fucked up right then and there. Uh, but, nope, says he'll never change and he gets his soul sucked out. Uh, then Freya apparently does a 180 with trying to kill him or anything. <laughs> and I love how Sindri comes out and just takes it from Atreus, I believe. And just smashes that thing. Like, everything about Sindri, ever since Brock's death, I fucking love 100%. Uh, it makes perfect sense for his character to do those things. So, everything about him was just great. But yeah, in conclusion to this whole discombobulated rant, like... To me, there's no way that somebody who could finish God of War 2018, think about all the plot threads that were opening up, thinking about all the directions the developers could have gone with this Ragnarok game, and then chose this. Like, this, to me, is completely underwhelming in every single facet of the story. Um, I felt like they were trying to have, like a like, a personal 
game, just like in 2018, where basically the story of the game is just, you know, you and your son going to the top of a mountain to spread your wife's ashes. Now, that's fine, because you could, you could spend all the game having personal relationships with your son like that, and it's no problem at all, because that's basically all the story is at that point. Uh, but in a game like Ragnarok, where you really are supposed to be focusing on this disastrous catastrophe that's going to happen, I, I felt like th the plot of that was thrown out the window just to have more like character bonding moments like you know you know in, instead of having more story related stuff we focused on thor being a drunkard um and that's how why we have kratos and atreus in the middle of a battlefield having like a two minute pet talk to each other even though for all they know enemies could still be coming around the corner or something like that um and it also annoyed me at the very end where Kratos opens that last prophecy and it shows him being a god that's being worshipped and all that and it's supposed to be a very touching moment where like you know all of Kratos' actions over the course of all God of War games has led to this moment which like on, on paper that that's great I would love for an ending like that uh, to happen it's just that the things that came right before that the whole game of Ragnarok like ho wholly spoils that moment there in my opinion um and not to mention it also is contradictory between oh you know prophecy doesn't define us but then oh we're gonna go with ragnarok prophecy anyway uh but then it still doesn't happen in the exact same way that the prophecy of ragnarok said and then we open this final prophecy and then oh wow it shows me being a god that's being worshipped and i'm protecting everyone like it it's still contradicting there but yeah that's basically it I, i'm sure there's some other stuff i forgot to put in here um but uh, to me after finishing god of war 2018 i just felt the story completely m had so many flaws in it and characters doing absolutely stupid things simply for the sake of you know finishing the norse saga that it just makes absolutely zero sense so yeah thank you for if you made it this far, thank you for listening to this. I know it was completely a discombobulated rant, and I know I keep repeating myself over and over throughout this multiple times, but yeah, I felt like 2018 was a much better game in comparison to this, at the very least in the story department.